name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ on West Good Avenue here in Wadsworth. Glad that you can join the program with us today. We've been doing a series of lessons, taking a look at the proofs for the inspiration of the Bible, talking about whether or not the Bible is God's Word or not. And we've been honing in the last few lessons on the, one of the areas of proof relating to fulfilled prophecy. And that's what we're going to pick up with in our program today. The idea of, you know, is there evidence for the Bible? Well, yeah, there is. You know, the Bible doesn't have anything to fear for an honest investigation. And that's, it's a key word, honest. You know, we, we look at facts, we look at evidence, we do that every day. Uh, we have different uh, ways of measuring evidence, what we accept as evidence. The same is true of the Bible. Uh, some people say that you know, you, if you don't have the scientific method, if you can't put the Bible through some kind of scientific method process, then that's not evidence. Well, that's just foolishness. That's just sort, short-sighted. Uh, we don't use the scientific method as the only form of evidence in everyday life. Uh, but to say that the Bible does not have evidence uh, is really a misstatement. But we're going to look at the argument that we're making about the idea of the proof from prophecy and so it says here, number one, if it's the case that the Bible makes prophecies of future events that are beyond a person's ability to fulfill, and these prophecies are documentable as fulfilled, then the Bible is beyond a naturalistic influence and requires a supernatural influence, in other words, God. And it is that case. It is a case that the Bible tells about things that happen way out in the future that's beyond the prophet's ability to know. And we have verification of that. And that's an important evidence because who, who could reveal that kind of thing? Or who could make certain things happen unless it's God? You know, just to put this definition up, we talk about a prophet. You know, some people, they sort of, they're always fascinated by the sort of the fortune telling kind of view of the prophet. But the prophets were more than that. They, they were not fortune tellers, uh, as some people use the term. Uh, Brother Jack Lewis, uh, he has his doctorate from Hebrew Union and also from Harvard. He makes this definition that's important to remember. One needs to, be, to free his thinking of the popular misconception that the prophet's primary task was that of predicting the future. We reflect that misconception when we say, I am no prophet. There is some prediction in prophecy, but the basic original meaning, even the English word prophet, is one who speaks for another. And he goes on to point out that you know, prophets, you know, they didn't just talk about things in the future that they couldn't have known. They also talk about things in the past that they couldn't have known. You know, we talk about Moses wrote the Pentateuch. He wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. But he records things in there that was impossible for him to know from firsthand observation. For example, Genesis all happened uh, before he was born. How could he write those things? He wasn't there to observe the events. Well, he was a prophet, and he revealed those things. Uh, so sometimes prophets dealt with the future. Sometimes they dealt with the past. Sometimes they dealt with things that are present, that are things that were outside of their knowledge to see. But they also were teachers, and they taught things that they, about what they saw as well. So there's more to being a prophet uh, than what some people uh, sometimes realize. Now, today I want to focus on the idea of Messianic prophecy. You know, I have this encyclopedia that uh, the Wazir Public Library was kind enough to help me obtain through interlibrary loan. But it's a encyclopedia here by John uh, J. Barton Payne, the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. You know, and he points out, rightfully so, you know, the Bible is a book of prophecy. There's no doubt. In his statistics he puts up there, uh, 8,352 of the 31-some thousand verses in the Bible are predictive in nature. Uh, that's about 27% according to his math. The greatest amount of Messianic prophecy, that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, occur in Psalms and also then in Isaiah. Uh, but one, you know, one thing about uh, this encyclopedia you need to keep in mind is that he's very premillennial in his interpretation of the Bible. So you may not agree with the way he categorizes prophecies or treat prophecies or things like that. So it's important you do your own research and your own study. I'm not premillennial. I don't believe in premillennialism. So there's a lot of things in his work that I would take issue with. But still, it gives you an idea. The Bible is a book of prophecy. And it's a book of Messianic prophecy. Now notice this statement from uh, Josh McDowell's book, um, The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He says the Old Testament, written over a period of 1,000 year period, contains nearly 300 references to the coming Messiah. All these were filled, for fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and they established a solid confirmation of his credentials as the Messiah. Now, 
you need to keep in mind that not all Messianic prophecies are alike. You know, sometimes, you know, we think about the ones that are really, um, maybe by our standards, stand out as incredible. Like, as, for example, Micah 5.2, where it talks about the Savior being born in Bethlehem, and, you know, the Herod's looking for the Savior, looking for the Messiah, looking for the King, because he wants to kill him. Uh, and he's trying to find out where he's at. And he goes to the Jews and asks, and they say, well, according to Micah 5.2, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Not every prophecy is necessarily the same type of prophecy as that. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, there's different types of prophecies. Sometimes uh, there's prophecies that come in as types or figures or different kind of things. So you, you need to keep that in mind. Um, you need to be careful, you know, also in various studies you look at, how they're counting uh, their prophecies too. But don't let those variables, as I'm talking about, deter you from the fact that the Bible clearly prophesied about the Messiah. Everybody recognizes that. And the question is, you know, how much does it do that? And how accurate are those? And what is the implications of that? That's what we're talking about. Now, Medal's statement, he says there's nearly 300 references. And obviously, you know, I can't cover all those. I'd like to, but I can't do that. Uh, not in the time that we have. But I thought what I would do is he cites a reference work uh, by Peter Stoner. And I'll put Peter Stoner's picture up there for you. Um, he lived from 1888 to 1980. He was a mathematician. He wrote a little book that's gone through uh, several printings called Silent, uh, excuse me, Science Speaks. Uh, it, was, it first came out in 1944, and you can see it online. There's a November 2005 update by, apparently, I don't know if it's his son or someone in the family that updated it. But he had a Master's of Science from the University of California. Uh, he also taught Pasadena City College for 41 years. He was chairman of the Department of Mathematics, Astronomy, and even one source said architecture uh, at Pasadena City College until 1953. He was chairman of the science division at Westmont College from 53 to 57. So this guy, I mean, he's definitely trained in mathematics, and that's going to be important as we go uh, forward and see that. But he makes this statement about what Messianic prophecy proves. He said, if we find these prophecies to be fulfilled in Christ, we will establish not only that Christ is the Messiah predicted in the Old Testament, but that those prophecies were given by himself, God himself, for if they were not given by God, no man would have fulfilled any number of them. And that's important to note. You know, we're not just talking about, you know, proving that the Bible is the word of God. Messianic prophecy proves that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. Christ is who he was. He was the Messiah. Some people say, well, Christ and Messiah, what are those two terms? Well, the Messiah, the anointed one, uh, that's the Hebrew form of it. Christ is the Greek form of the anointed one. So you have Messiah, which is Hebrew, and you have Christ, which is Greek, and they both mean the anointed one. That's why we have those two different terms uh, in our Bibles. So Jesus Christ, Christ was not his last name. Uh, that points out that he is the Messiah. Now, Stoner went through in his work, and he, he selected eight Old Testament prophecies, and he calculated with some fairly conservative numbers what the probability would be uh, that these prophecies, Messianic prophecies, being fulfilled. And he calculated it to be 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Well, what, what does that number look like? Well, I typed it up there. Hopefully, it'll show up on your screen. Uh, but I looked it up online, and it says that this number would be called uh, 100 quadrillion. You know, we, we talk a lot about uh, in our paper and our news and stuff about the federal debt, and the federal debt being in trillions of dollars, tri, um, that's uh, you know, TRS3, uh, Latin, that's where we get the word trillion from. Well, the next branch of numbers, if our country survives, if it keeps, uh, if it keeps recklessly spending the way it does and doesn't get its fiscal house in order, the next group of numbers we're going to be talking about won't be trillion, it'll be quadrillion. And another way of expressing that, the, that uh, is 100,000 trillion. That's if eight prophecies were fulfilled. You know, and that's, a really, um, that's really a big number. And it, uh, he put down this visualization of it, and I want to read one of them. I, I like all of them, but I thought I'd just share one with you, how to visualize what that number is. He says, suppose that we take 1,017 silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes 
but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. I was like, oh, that's just insane. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. That's just beyond imagination. Exactly. That's eight prophecies. Uh, he would go on. <clears throat> he did a calculation for 16 prophecies, and this is the number that he came up with. Uh, that is a one quat quattro decillion number. That's one followed by 45 zeros. Um, so, and he doesn't list the 16. He only lists eight uh, in his work. But we'll look at that in a second. And then he goes on, and he does the calculation again. He was in the department chair of mathematics, and he had this project they were working on. And they did the calculation based on 48 prophecies. And they did the probability calculation of that. And he calculated it, his group calculated it to be 1 to 10 to the 157th power. Now, I have no idea what that number is. That's basically one with 157 zeros behind it. My chart I was looking at didn't go up that high. So I have no idea what that number is. But I do like his statement he says about it. He says the, this is a really large number, and it represents an extremely small chance. And I'm like, really? You think so? It, it definitely is. I mean, that's a huge number. And that's the odds that you can find that someone from ancient today or when he wrote it, when he did a calculation sometime probably in the, in the 40s, um, you know, what's the odd you could find one person who fulfilled 48 of these Old Testament prophecies? And that's the number. Now, the question I want to ask you is, can we find 48 Messianic prophecies? And so let's just take a look. We'll start uh, with the first set. Uh, this is the first set of eight, and this would bring us to the probability that he gave of 10 to the 17th power. And I listed the eight prophecies that he listed in his book. And I tried to make sure I didn't duplicate any. Um, so I tried to make sure I was c careful about that. But the, here are the first eight and the odds of the fulfillment of someone just randomly doing it, uh, which is sort of uh, ridiculous even at the first. But he goes on. But notice you have you born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, the forerunner, John the Baptist, uh, Malachi 3.1, uh, the king comes on a colt, Zechariah 9.9, his hands would be wounded, Zechariah 13, 6, uh, 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12, uh, money for the potter, Zechariah 11, 13, he'd be silent during his affliction, Isaiah 53, 7, his hands and feet would be pierced, uh, Psalm 22, 16. So that's the first set, then if you go on, uh, like I said, he only recorded eight, but let's just go on, the second set, I just grabbed second set from Josh McDowell's work, and this will bring the odds up to 10 to the 45th power. And look at some of these are very familiar to you, uh, I would imagine, uh, many to many of them. Born of a seed of a woman, Genesis 3.15. Born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14. Born of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49.10. Born of the family of Jesse, Isaiah 11, verse 1. Born of the house of David, Jeremiah 23.5. Presented gifts, Psalm 72.10. Women would weep at the, at the death of their children, Jeremiah 31.15. And he would be a prophet like Moses, Deuteronomy 18. 18. And you got to keep in mind, too, these prophecies were written by various writers over a, a big time span, too. So it's not like somebody just sat down and wrote out, you know, so many prophecies. Here's what you're looking for. No, these are different writers from different time frames, from different periods. They're all giving little clues, as God has revealed it to them, that's going to add up. And that's something to keep in mind. But let's go on to the third set. Here's our third set of eight prophecies that I, that I selected. Um, this is another one from Micah 5, 2, uh, that he pre-existed. He has a pre-existence. You know, he was, you know, we talk about, you know, when the Savior was born in Bethlehem and all. Well, that's when he came into the world. But you need to recognize that he existed before he came to the earth. He was pre-existent, uh, Micah 5, verse 2. And then others, you call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. He'd be called Lord, Psalm 110, 1. He would serve as priest, Psalm 110.4. He would serve as judge, uh, Isaiah 33.2. He would serve as a king, Psalm 2, verse 6. The Holy Spirit would rest upon him, Isaiah 11.2. He would be zealous for God's house, Psalm 69 and verse 9. So that's the series that brings us up to number 24. But let's go on the number uh, to the fourth set. This will bring us up to 32 prophecies. He'd be light to the Gentiles, uh, Psalm, Isaiah 63. The resurrection, uh, Psalm 16:10. The ascension, Psalm 68:18. He would sit at the right hand of God, Psalm 110, verse 1. Betrayed by a friend, Psalm 41:9. 
forsaken by his disciples, Zechariah 13, 7, accused by false witness, Psalm 35, verse 11, and he would be spit upon, Isaiah 50 and verse 6. And then the fifth set uh, of prophecies here, this will bring us up to number 40, um, there's, and there's a lot of different images. There's a lot of different snapshots of what this Messiah is going to look like, or maybe not so much what he looks like, how, what he's going to do, the things he's going to accomplish, the things he's going to say, the things that he's going to teach. Uh, you can see more of that um, as we go through the list, too. Uh, the use of parables, Psalm 78, too. You know, we still talk about the great parables of Jesus. I wonder how many people realize it was prophesied that he would speak in parables, uh, that he would do that. Also, he performed miracles, Isaiah 9, verse 1. The ministry, his ministry would begin in Galilee, Isaiah 9, 1. He would enter the temple, Malachi 3, 1. A stone of stumbling to the Jews he would be, Psalm 118, 22. But he would be light to the Gentiles, Isaiah 6, verse 3. Excuse me, 60, verse 3. Uh, he would be mocked, Psalm 22, 7 through 8. And then he would become weak in his knees, Psalm 109, uh, verses uh, 24 through 25, talking about not being able to bear his cross. And then the sixth set of eight prophecies will take us to 41 to 48. Uh, he would be crucified with thieves, Isaiah 53, 12. He would, be, he would intercede for the transgressors, Isaiah 53, 12. He would be hated without cause, 69, excuse me, Psalm 69, 4. His family and friends stood away from him, Psalm 38 and verse 11. He would become reproached to others, Psalm 109, verse 25. And people stare at him, Psalm 22, 17. And one thing to keep in mind, if you haven't figured it out yet, PF is prophecy fulfilled. And this just gives you a citation there of, of one uh, place where you could look at to see that it was fulfilled. And number 47, divided garments and cast lots, Psalm 22, verse 18. Uh, then uh, he would become thirsty, given vinegar to drink, Psalm 69, and verse 21. So that completes um, our 48 uh, prophecies. And there's, it's interesting, you know, now some people might say, well, you know, I can think of others. Well, I'm sure you can. Some of you might think, you know, well, well I wonder why you selected those. Well, I just picked them. I mean, I, I just picked them at random almost. I used the Stoner book to get the eight that he used for his math. And then I used uh, Josh McDowell's work to, to fill that up. But there's other sources as well. But, you know, there's some that you may like better than some of these. You know, they're all different. Uh, one of them, uh, he cried to God when he was forsaken. Remember when he was on the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, that was prophesied. That was prophesied in Psalm 22, verse 1. Or sometimes we talk about, you know, not a bone of his body would be broken. You know, that was prophesied. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 20. Or that he would be put in a rich man's tomb. You know, he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Was a, was a wealthy man, and they put him in that tomb, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 9. So, you know, I, like I said, I just picked 48 prophecies just to get up to uh, Peter Stoner's work um, that he said, 48, was that big number. But let me ask you, you know, if you don't like that, set of li that list of numbers, if you say, I don't like that list, I, I want a different list, or maybe there's a prophecy that's not, maybe it just doesn't become as clear to me as it does to somebody else. Maybe I'm, you know, I'm not so convinced. Maybe 47, maybe 40 of them, but well, you know what you could do? You could make your own list. That, that's just a sampling. Uh, take a look at uh, this work. Um, you know, like I said, keep in mind, you gotta remember that Messianic prophecies, sometimes are straight out predictions, sometimes they're symbols or types or figures. Uh, but if you look here at this book, What Shall We Do With the Bible? You know, this, this book here, and I, I want to recommend a couple of books for you, and I, I'll just put them up here. I won't say much about the books themselves, but on the, underneath the book is the website and the phone number you can get it from if you're interested. But if you look at the top, it tells you there's some 330 prophecies to pick from. Now, we, picked it, we looked at 48, and we did it very briefly. But that website there at the top, you know, you can go to that website, it's a real nice website, and it has over 300 some odd prophecies, and it tells you where they're fulfilled. In this book that, uh, What Shall We Do With the Bible, another writer by the name of Bernard Ram, uh, he did a calculation of his own. Now, I, I'm not a mathematician. I mean, I had several courses in statistics and all that, but I mean, this kind of, this kind of math is beyond me uh, to figure out. So I'm always interested in different ways that people calculate the number. 
But that's his calculation, uh, Bernard Ram's calculation, uh, what the odds are, the probability of someone fulfilling 330 of those prophecies. And I just typed it out there. Uh, that's 84 whatever of 1%. So it's, less, it's far less than 1%. So, I mean, at some point in time, you're like, how much evidence do you need? How much evidence do you need? The Bible, I mean, that's just, and keep in mind, too, that's, that's talking about just Messianic prophecy. And you add all these up, all these different prophecies, and you look at the life of Jesus in Nazareth, and you can see it. You can see it. Now, the people that wrote those prophecies couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. The Bible tells us that the writers didn't fully understand what they were writing, but they wrote. They wrote what God told them to write. And now we have the benefit, you know, we can take the Bible and we can say, okay, here's an Old Testament prophecy and okay, here's a New Testament fulfillment. Anybody could see that. Well, it, it wasn't that easy for them. So that's something to keep in mind as well. But there, there's a cumulative effect of all these prophecies adding up. Um, you know, take, take a look at this statement. This is in uh, Jim Lewis's lecture, The Fulfillment of Predictive Prophecy as Proof of Inspiration. This is from a Spiritual Sword Lectureship book. Uh, and I'll put the book up there and I'll read the statement to you. It's from the getwellchurchofchrist.org. And the phone number is there if you want to order it. It's, a, it's an excellent book if you'd like to study this kind of thing further. But he quotes Thomas Horne's Introduction to the Scriptures. And I want you to think about the idea that you know, all these prophecies, they, they fit together. And it's like a woven fabric of proof. And this is the way that Horn made the statement. It is worthy of remark that the most of these predictions were delivered nearly and some of them more than 3,000 years ago. Any one of them is sufficient to indicate a prescience uh, more than human. But the collective force of all taken together is such that nothing more can be necessary to prove the interposition of omniscience than the establishing of their authenticity. So what he's saying is that you take all these prophecies together and, and, they, and the accumulation of them, and it's so powerful, it's like, how, how can you deny it? How can you deny that? Well, a lot of people won't deny it. They just won't look at it. Or they'll disregard it. Or they'll pick me a prophecy and they'll say, well, I don't see it that way. Okay, all right, that's one. Okay, you have 329 more to go. Or that's 20. You have 310 more to go. I mean, at one point in time, you finally realize it adds up. And that's important uh, for us to keep in note. So before we go, let's, uh, let's take a look at our argument one more time before we close up. If it is the case that the Bible makes prophecies of future events that are beyond a person's ability to fulfill, and these prophecies are documentable as fulfilled, then the Bible is beyond a naturalistic influence and requires a supernatural influence, in other words, God. Number two, it is the case that the Bible makes prophecies of future events which are beyond the prophet's ability to fulfill, which are verifiably true. Therefore, the Bible is the work of a supernatural influence, in other words, God. Now, keep in mind, too, one thing I want to remind you of, you know, this program today just looked at Messianic prophecy. Messianic prophecies are prophecies, as we looked at it, in the Old Testament that looks at Jesus of Nazareth as being the Messiah, being the Christ, the Son of God. Don't lose sight of the fact that that doesn't discount all the other prophecies that don't relate to that. This is just one group of prophecies, prophecies that relate uh, to Jesus being the Messiah. You know, the, book, the Bible is a book of prophecy. It's filled with all kinds of prophecies. And that's important to note. But you know what? Some of the prophecies of the Bible are not yet fulfilled. Jesus, when he left this earth and went to the right-hand side of God, he said he was going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to judge the world. He's going to judge you. Are you ready for that day? Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map, don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. 
As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, it has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we have our troubles. Satan scares we must evade. We'll be free from all temptations where the rose is never paid. Yeah.